Hi, everyone. I wanted to present our first battle screencast today, and that is for the Battle of Fort Sumter. And the biggest thing I want you to take from it is that at this point in the war, as we just start, everyone is so innocent or maybe ignorant of what's coming. They have no idea that a terrible war is about to be brewing. And I have in the statement here, a bloodless battle to begin a bloody war. No one knew what they were starting. They truly did not. They thought in either side, north or south, they both thought this whole thing was going to be done in about three months, that either the north would win in one big battle or the south would be able to win a battle or two and they'd gain their freedom and they'd move on, have independence, and then we'd have two nations. But what truly happens is you see in this battle, I'll give a little uh, spoiler here, the south's going to win this battle. They're going to take this one. And it's going to start the ball rolling for a momentum for the South. And we'll see where it goes from here. Now, let's get into the lesson. The objective here is to identify how the Confederacy was able to succeed in the Battle of Fort Sumter. So if we come out and we can understand why the South won this battle, we're good. We got this. Now, either before this, this video, you could pause where I'm at here and take a look at this now. Or after I speak, you could take a look at this Battlefield Trust video. They do a great job trying to go through some of the different battlefield actions what happened why it happened who won all that good stuff so take a look at the video either now or later now charleston south carolina was one of the biggest southern trading cities and fort sumter was sitting out there in the harbor a perfect huge six foot thick walls 40 feet high walls like this great just uh, amazing structure out there in the harbor and a perfect place for the union to hold now, they didn't have much of a force, which you're going to find out about later, but the fort was fantastic. It was extremely strong, and it was a great place, especially. It was originally built for defense against people like the British, but it was a very good protection for that area of Charleston Harbor, for that great trading city. Did you see it out here in the distance, out there in Charleston Harbor? Just a, a look at it here. Once again, you see Fort Sumter. There's the actual city of Charleston. Now, I want you to see this because it really shows you who has the advantage in this battle. Here you have one group of Union soldiers, and here are all the groups that the Confederates had and all the forts they had. They have six on this side. I've lost count on this side of how many they have, but goodness gracious. And each one of these is within firing range of Fort Sumter. So the Confederates, they've got a ton of cannon waiting to blast. And they have so many more soldiers, so many more forts. The Union, they don't have much. I was going to save this for later, but the Union only has 85 total men and six usable cannon in this battle. And they had this all in one fort. Yeah, the fort's strong, but goodness gracious, like they certainly could have used some more soldiers and some more usable cannon. Now, one of the cool themes here is you have, and one of the themes about the Civil War is you have friends against friends mentors against mentees and you have one of these relationships right here so the teacher faces off against the student robert anderson is the union leader here at fort sumter he actually was a southerner he's from georgia and he decides to stay loyal to the north he wants to keep his pledge that he gave to the union to defend the union and so he's going to stay with the north he's a good veteran of, of multiple different wars and he's facing off against for the south pgt beauregard a French Creole from New Orleans. And he's one of the first defectors from the Union Army, from the United States Army, to go to the South. Now, the crazy thing is, he was a teacher assistant at West Point, and his mentor was this guy right here. And actually, they had such a good relationship that Robert Anderson asked PGT Beauregard if he would stay at West Point for an additional year just to work with him more. So these guys are great friends. And here they are blasting off cannon against one another in the first battle of the Civil War. So friend against friend. Now, before the battle, the South knew that a ship carrying food was heading down to Fort Sumter. Lincoln sent them the notice. Lincoln wanted them to know. And he wanted them to know, if you fire on the ship, the war's on you. And so they totally knew. And so PGT Beauregard, he is feeling some heat. The papers around Charleston, South Carolina were making him out to be a coward. And so he sent out a truce ship under a white flag to go out there to Fort Sumter and try to get Robert Anderson to give up the fort without a fight. 
hand over, handed over the Confederates, let them take control of the fort. Anderson said, I have not received any orders. I cannot withdraw the fort. I cannot give it up. Until I receive notice from Abraham Lincoln, or until I run out of food, I must stay here in this fort. BGT Beauregard sent out another ship to try to get Anderson to surrender the fort, and he wouldn't do it. Anderson said once again, April 15th, I'll be out of food. I will leave then, but unless I receive orders, I must follow orders, and I haven't gotten anything yet. So PGT Beauregard's uh, peace commissioner said, well, if you're not going to give it up, be prepared for an onslaught at 4.30 a.m., one hour from now. And so on April 12th, 4.30 a.m., the first shots struck out of Fort Sumter and started out the battle. Now, let me get to that first here. The first big cannon shot was a very ceremonial one. The thing was, like, it didn't even have that good of a range. It's kind of ridiculous. But they decided to uh, fire a 64-pounder cannon. It shoots a 64-pound ball. Try to pick it up like a 64-pound medicine ball. It's kind of ridiculous. But usually they're going to use 12 or 16-pound cannon within the Civil War. This is just a ceremonial shot. It's ridiculous. The shot doesn't even get close to the fort. I don't know why they bothered doing it. But from that point forward, it's going to get thicker. It's going to get crazier. Now, for the Union, not only did they only have 85 men and six usable cannon, but on top of that, they weren't running out of food. And for the last couple of days, Robert Anderson's Union soldiers were only being fed two total crackers a day as their rations, nothing more. I'm sure they had some water, but altogether two crackers a day, that was their entire nourishment. It's ridiculous. These guys are kind of sour in the fact that they might actually have to fight to begin with. They weren't really prepared for this. They hadn't fought at all so far. They were just really kind of defending the coastline and sitting around doing nothing. And here they, ha they can't even get a good meal. So they're pretty ticked off and they uh, don't really have many soldiers to begin with. And one more piece here. Does the food ever show up? No. The supply ship gets fired on by some of the Confederates and that ship never even gets to Fort Sumter. So these guys never even receive their rations. After that 64 pounder is shot, a 34 hour bombardment follows. So from all those different forts the Confederates had, they're just blasting away. And the soldiers inside Fort Sumter are also blasting back, but they only have six cannon that are well protected. And so they're only using those six. The Union doesn't really have that much of a chance. There are thousands of soldiers they're facing off against, and they've got a, a whopping total of 85 men. Fort Sumter looks like this on the left before the battle. Afterwards, it's blown to smithereens. Now, in the end, the Union decides that it is time for them to give the fort. But the real reason is, it's April 14th. They said, tomorrow, we're totally out of food. We only have enough food to take us back to New York City on a boat. And so we have to leave anyway. So it's not that anybody actually died. It's not that they were like, that the fort was really taken over by the Confederates or blasted the point where they couldn't actually hold it anymore. The Union was just running out of food. That's the real cause of the ending of Fort Sumter. With that, it's time to hand over the fort to the Confederates. The stupid thing about the, the final negotiations is that Robert Anderson said, I want to have a gun salute. I want to have a 21-gun salute to the United States flag. When we take down our flag, I want to be able to salute our flag. There were zero battle casualties in the entire fight at Fort Sumter. Not a single person got significantly hurt. Not a single person died in the Battle of Fort Sumter. The fort was that strong that no one inside it actually was hurt in any way. But during that 21-gun salute, one of the cannons actually blasted. It was, it was overheated. It got destroyed. And all of a sudden, one soldier got killed and two horses actually died just from that exploding cannon. So no casualties in the battle. But ridiculously, you actually have one soldier and two horses die in the aftermath of the battle as they're trying to take down the flag and do a salute to the uh, United States flag. So totally ridiculous. Battle not deadly, but it did have tremendous consequences for the Union. Four more states see this as an act of war by the Union. Despite the fact that the South fired the first shot, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas are going to secede here. Four states are going to leave, but actually for Abraham Lincoln, he kind of expected that. 
the states he was really concerned with were Maryland and Kentucky. So, yeah, altogether, he's kind of angry that four more states left and went to the Confederacy, but at least it wasn't 15. Four more states left. Originally, you had seven states for the Confederacy, those seven deep south states that you see in the light blue here, and then four more leave. But what Lincoln's happy about is that Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri, they stayed loyal to the Union. And so he's not going to end up having to fight a battle, fight a fight against all of those states. Now, you see one more here, too. West Virginia was just the counties of Virginia that did not decide to secede. And so we actually grant West Virginia their statehood two years into the war in 1863. So they weren't a state at the beginning of the war, but they become one halfway through the war. And they stay loyal to the Union as well. So Lincoln is ecstatic that not all of the slave states actually left. He's only going to have to fight a war against 11 states. Now, that's going to be tough enough, but at least it's not 15. Now, final note, no one really knew what they truly started. Lincoln didn't know. The South didn't either. Both sides expected a quick war that would not be very bloody. Were they ever wrong? The battle was bloodless, but it wouldn't last long. We're about to get real with things. And altogether, you're going to get into some terribly bloody battles. And you're going to end up with a war that has 624,000 deaths. Please make sure to finish the lesson by completing the Google form so I can see where you're at and what you picked up along the way. Thank you.